So, Lewis Samuels, welcome to the new school. Thanks for having me. As you just heard, we do a long series of talks about uh, things like the environment, there's arts, culture, poetics, but to, and all these things are in some way dealing with the issue of the real meaning of life. But today we're finally going to get into what the meaning of life is. <laughs> Surfing. <laughs> now, I was, uh, we had talked, uh, a few of us here at Conwheel, talking about upcoming talks, and we were thinking about all these surfer people. We thought, let's have one on surfing. And, Fig famous figures that we know, uh, and we were thinking about various people, and then it just like a bell went off. Well, I know Lewis Samuels. He was born here. He's a fantastic surf fighter. Let's get him. He was very gracious and said, sure, I'd love to. And so here he is. So, Lewis, I think you know that one of my sidelines, actually, besides doing these kind of things, is uh, addictionology. Right. You may have heard of the concept of an intervention mm -hmm. that people do where I you have. get family and friends and various professionals along and get you in the room together and talk about <laughs> if something has becoming a problem that has taken over your life, right? Right. So that's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> and I actually have this book here I brought along, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. And, you know, as you may have heard, you may have heard of this before. We're talking about a surfing addiction, I take it, Yes, right? yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> well, I hope so. I mean, if other things come up, we'll, we'll, we're happy to deal with that, too. If we're going to talk about a surfing addiction, at least let's do it over beers, because <laughs> that's, uh, these are now 25 ounces. There's enough for everyone well, who wants to sip. There are cups out there, yeah, but there's Lewis cups. will give you some. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I've definitely, great. I've wondered about it, uh, I have to say, um, when you uh, cheers, take a look. Cheers, by Yeah, so Cheers. Uh, this is how the, the history of surfing and all kind of surfing culture and literature really is just about this level of discourse. It's uh, you know two people sitting around having beers at the end of a day after they get out of the water, and uh, not unlike uh, fish stories or uh, you know two guys right. at the bar stool discussing the meaning of life. It's it's about that level of intellectualism. So I thought this was appropriate to ground us in what we're doing here. I I went for a, a good affordable beer, two dollars and nineteen cents. By yeah. the way, I'll yeah. pay you later. That's a first for the new school. It uh, <laughs> makes it feel more real to me too. Okay, so. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over surfing, that our lives had become unmanageable. Um, unmanageable may be a strong word, but I'll just start with back in the beginning. You grew up here, so I'm assuming that your first time you surfed was here in Bolinas, right? Yeah, it was. Um, and just you... another little beach rat in the shore break here in Bolinas. Um, and, you know, luckily it, I grew up somewhere that uh, our backyard is the beach as opposed to being an urban basketball court or anything else. But right. I think it's no different than that. It's just utilizing the open space that is around you. And um, I had a couple friends who were going to the beach. And uh, my, my parents were not beach people, uh, East Coasters, uh, who moved to Bolinas in the uh, late 60s. So for them, I think it was a little bit foreign to, as opposed to just walk on the beach, like go out into that. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, uh, it just looked like fun. and. Um, found myself doing it and getting you, uh, flogged you, and drawn in right from the beginning. Were you usually out in front here at the beach or were you, I mean, out at... Uh... A lot at Stinson, actually, when I was really young because I had a, a good friend who lived right in the Kaya's there mm -hmm. and um, they had a pile of surfboards and skimboards and, you know, all that kind of stuff in the backyard and we would just take them out there. And then later on, uh, yeah, right down uh, on Brighton Street, uh, my aunt lived for many years up on terrace, so mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I would you be dropped off there, and when I was done surfing, I was instructed to walk up the hill to her house and use the phone to call my parents and say it was time to pick me up. Not bad. So do you remember, actually, the first time you felt on a particular wave or something like that, that I mean, this is amazing, this is what I want to do, I can't, I, you know, I got to do this all the time? Yeah, you know, strangely enough, one of my earliest memories, it wasn't even actually riding a wave, it was trying to walk uh, between that little gap at the seawall on Brighton where at a high tide, you know, the waves will just smash against it. And uh, we didn't time it right. And uh, my mother and I just got completely soaked. And I remember really excitedly saying, we were flabbergasted. <laughs> we were flabbergasted. And like, that was my description of it. And uh, I think it was just the excitement of the energy of the ocean, you know? And um, so even before I started surfing, I was drawn to it. And then some of it was actually seeing Surfer Magazine. Uh, in the library in Bolinas, uh, the Bolinas School. Like they had, you know, a uh, Highlights Magazine and mm -hmm. um, the usual kind of stuff you'd expect. And then they had Surfer Magazine because it was a coastal town. And, you know, uh, 
it definitely I owe a thanks to the librarian who deemed it appropriate even to have this magazine that was like, you know, 1980s pop culture, really, to a large degree, uh, there with the rest of them. And the pictures drew me in, and I ended up at Livewater at Stinson, and I was kind of the shop rat there, like washing out wetsuits and learning from the older guys. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a rich tradition in Molina Stinson of uh, great surfers going back many, many years. And uh, it's kind of more one of those uh, passing on the knowledge type things, uh, as opposed to bigger urban surfing environments where um, it was a little bit more diffuse, you know, like it really was like a, a small, pretty tight-knit community when I started here, mm -hmm. um, even in the, I guess that would be the 80s, you know, mid-80s. Mm -hmm. Well, localism is a big deal in surfing, right. surfing anywhere right. in the world practically, but particularly in small communities in California and so forth. So, I mean, you were a local and you were very young, so did you feel welcomed in, you never had a problem, and then did you become one of the uh, bad guys, the locals? Um, you know, I, I think part, it's just like fraternities or something that like part of the, the localism comes from the fact that like everyone else went through that same initiation. So mm -hmm. when I was a kid, uh, regardless of whether I was like, you know, one of the only local kids surfing, I was still definitely put through the ringer to a certain degree by some of the older guys who are actually like great friends with me now. Um, but they were not particularly nice. I mean, I think surfing is one of those things that mm -hmm. uh, has a rich tradition of, uh, you know, especially in Northern California, like the better you surf, the you know, the more of a, a jerk you are to people. Mm -hmm. That was like one of the things that went along with it. Uh, certainly growing up, it seemed that way. Mm -hmm. So do you think some of this is a Darwinian struggle for waves because there's such actually a limited resource and that's what everybody's looking oh, yeah. for? And there's... It is very simplistic human behavior. It's going back to, you know, uh, limited resources and struggle to control them. And it's no different than like, uh, probably anyone who understands primatology would be like expertly equipped to uh, deal with a, you know, mm -hmm. getting waves in a crowd. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the stuff you see, and it still comes into play, you know, like I'm not a young man at, at this point, but uh, most people aren't like putting themselves in a situation where like it's, there's a reasonable chance they're going to get in a fist fight like mm -hmm. during their morning recreation. And even now in 2015, with all the litigation involved in surfing, like that's still totally the case, you know, mm -hmm. that like you'll see guys screaming at each other, and um, sometimes that's a part of my morning. Uh, you know, that it's just like uh, the, the resources are really, really limited. Um, I think people who, who don't surf don't have a clear understanding of just how uh, little there is to go around when it comes to perfect waves. Like, it, it's, it's a very, very rare thing. And um, that, that goes for, you know, a given day. And it goes for, you know, like across the year and across the planet and all the rest of it. That it's, it's this bizarrely... Uh, rare thing really for all the, the variables to come together so when you have people out there and they're experiencing that there's going to be a lot of competition for it and um, the things that determine whether somebody gets a, a wave or not in a crowd uh, some of it comes down to like ability but a lot of it just comes down to cunning and um, how ruthless you are and mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of different variables involved and then this is a time-honored way, actually, to get waves in, in a crowd if you don't know people. It's just to show up at the parking lot with beers and, uh, <laughs> and be nice to people. That works, too. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, uh, I mean, would you agree, basically, that it's gotten much worse in, in say, you know, I mean, you, you've been there. I mean, I was, uh, I was more of uh, ahead of you. The 70s right. it was a big deal, but I grew up down in uh, Newport Beach, basically, which is Surf City, too. So yeah. there were always a lot of people, but I mean, the, the general feeling is is that with, for a number of reasons, surfing has gotten so popular and so much more accessible in some ways, whether it's internet or otherwise, that it's just gotten worse and worse all over. The crowding's certainly gotten much, much worse, uh, you know, particularly in Northern California. Um, and uh, out here, you know, too, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, like, uh, in a lot of ways, the localism and the, uh, the level of violence and animosity in the water based on overcrowding has actually largely gone down. I think it's just like rounded the corner from uh, much more of a set, uh, you know, hierarchical structure in which there are alpha males controlling a lineup. And now it's just a free for all, you know, like when you have little kids out there on soft boards, you know, being bold enough to actually have fun surfing as opposed to taking it seriously as this, you know, like a you know, Hemingway-esque act. Like uh, it kind of makes it more difficult to go out there and scream at people when you know, well, who you're screaming out is like a seven-year-old. Yeah, right. And you're a grown man. It you gets only a do that ridiculous. at home, right? So, right, yeah. exactly. 
Well, Bolinas has always been known as a great beginner spot, and right. also in more recent times, it's really known as, I mean, it, it's amazing how, in terms of gender, how uh, equitable it is. There's so many more women surfing here than there used to be, too. And yeah. that's happening, I think, also all around uh, in most places, too, not maybe in the biggest places. The big contests are right. rare to see women, but, but you've noticed that probably, it, It's too. much more even, and, you know, I mean, I yeah. think, again, it goes back to, a, like, a, there was a point when surfing in America was kind of this, like, you know, boys town activity, that it was a, it was one of those things, like, watching football or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just uh, going fishing, that it was more of kind of something the boys would get together and do, and uh, girls were very purposefully excluded from it uh, for a long, long time. And uh, even when I was a kid, I do remember there was, like, you know, a fair bit of complaints as if, like, a woman had wandered into you know, the men's locker room or something at the gym, kind of like, well, what are they doing out here? <laughs> and uh, some of it had to do with equipment as well. You know, the early boards were just a lot heavier and more cumbersome. And um, there was this misnomer that you needed to have some level of, like, brute physical strength to surf. And so men would try to use that as a way to suggest that it was better suited for them than women, which, of course, is totally ridiculous um, because there was plenty of guys who were like me, you know, probably weaker than most women, surfing and <laughs> doing fine at it. Um, but yeah, it's certainly turned the corner now. It's much more of a... Yeah. So you grew up now. here. You went into the city to high school. You were surfing a lot in mm -hmm. the city then, and now you live out by Ocean Beach, which yeah. is this uh, long stretch of highly variable waves and highly variable conditions and often very challenging. I mean, when I started there in the... 80s, the general rule was was 40 minutes per wave of paddling, <laughs> you know, right. on a good day, you know. So, but so you you mastered that. You're a local there, and and uh, he's a really great surfer too. I mean, you, you saw the uh, picture. Maybe those of you who've seen the ad down in Indonesia and so forth and so. Um, but being hit by that water at would you say 10 years old and, and yelling out flabbergasted mm -hmm. was the word. So you were already a budding writer. It sounds like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, that vocabulary. So how did you first feel that you wanted to also write about surfing besides just doing it? Well, you know, th there was a really tight-knit surf culture in and unto of itself here in, in Bolinas in Northern California. But the idea of, like, the surf world at large, uh, like, what's in the magazines, you know, professional surfing and uh, that whole side of things was totally foreign. It was not a part of uh, what we had up here at all. Like, it was really just you know, a handful of us, some of the guys I see here today sitting in the audience going surfing together. Um, so I was really an outsider to that side of surfing, right? The whole idea of this industry and uh, commercialism and professionalism attached to what for us was like, you know, a pretty bucolic activity. And um, everything I learned about it was really just from reading those magazines, you know. Um, and I'd read the articles and it kind of drew me in. It was like a, a lot of the writing is really like geared towards kids, for one thing. It's, it's pretty yeah, there were low level stuff. When I was going, there basically were two magazines. So there was Surfer, right. which has been around forever, and Surfing. And I came to think of Surfer was basically geared for people who were maybe 20, and Surfing was for people who were like 12. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the, the, the general right. level of a lot of the writing, with some exceptions, of course, right. you know. And, and so the bar was pretty low. Yeah. In terms of the, the quality of the writing. It still is. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a part of continuing that tradition. No, you um, I mean, I would say, and people, people have said, and I could quote, you know, this, the, our, our mutual friend, the great surf, surf historian, Matt Warshaw, who's written this mighty tome, among other books, and has an online uh, continuation of his encyclopedia of surfing, right. you know. I mean, he would basically say that you're one of the few people who's raised the bar for surfing writing, and, and I agree. I mean, you do a fantastic job at the things that you decide to write about, um, to the point where I think a lot of your readers probably don't understand what you're talking about. Right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I try to assume that, like, uh, maybe there's a few people in, people in your audience who, who don't understand what you're talking about, but... I was that person as a kid, you know, like as a kid reading those magazines, there was stuff that went over my head and yeah. some of it was because there were a handful of guys who were actually, you know, raising the bar a little bit for uh, what they were writing about in the magazine and some of it was just all the details of the culture, you know, like yeah. the vernacular, the terms used, uh, the history of it and you pick it up little by little. So I think in terms of, uh, I remember someone saying that to me when I first started writing about surfing, that you got to really 
like picture that you are writing for a 12 year old kid and like don't try to you know make it more intellectual or grandiose than mm -hmm. it actually is but from my perspective it was kind of nice to say well look you know why not assume that that 12 year old kid if he's not you know into that th that kind of thing right now he might be in a year mm -hmm. you know like so how did so. you break into doing um actually being published I tried here and there uh, when it was still strictly a print thing, you know, just to send stuff into the magazines and didn't have a lot of luck with that. I mean, basically, to a large degree, uh, at that point, it was still all about being in that little clique of guys in the industry in Orange County who are doing the magazines. And if you do someone at one of the magazines, you're going to get your stuff in the magazine. And that was kind of just how it went, you know. And people broke through in oddball ways, but largely it had to do with being there in person. Like you just had to move to Southern California and be near the magazines, which was something that I didn't really want to do. Um, so eventually uh, I ended up submitting stuff online in kind of the beginning of the whole like era of journalism in general going online. And uh, there was kind of this little period of time in the early oddies where uh, people stopped reading the magazines largely because you had to pay for them and started reading the stuff online because it was free. And it seemed like some of the guys who were more established writers in surfing didn't have a great understanding of how quickly that shift was happening, just as in other walks of life, so that like uh, they were getting people like me to write stuff for free uh, online, but like our audience was actually bigger than people in the, in the magazines. And, and that's still the case now, that like the stuff online gets way more uh, you know, way more of an audience than what you're going to do in print. Um, so I was able to, I think, kind of make a name for myself quickly just because I was taking advantage of that, that mm -hmm. different format that was a little bit more immediate and, uh, you know, free to access. And there was just a whole generation of people who were reading that stuff online. That Where were you first published? Uh, on, online or otherwise? Was it Surfer? Or? No, it was not Surfer. It was uh, either Surfline or so something called Water Magazine, which is now defunct. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember which. I think maybe Water Magazine did a piece I wrote about Indonesia that was just like sent out there into the ether and they happened to like it. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, it was Surfline. And Surfline, which was online only, it's not a uh, print magazine at all, is uh, where I definitely made a name for myself. And I think that in the little, you know, backwater pond of writing about surfing, I'm probably like the first guy to have that entry into it of coming strictly from an online perspective and then turning that into you know, something that went into print and so on and so forth. Every, everyone else was kind of like more through the traditional path of interning at the magazine, paying their dues, doing the things you do, mm -hmm. and then ending up in print eventually, an editor or something like that. So that was a little unique, I think, and that I definitely just used you know, what was there for me in terms of trying to differentiate and ruffle feathers and go for controversial articles in, in order to, uh, you know, on some level make a name for myself, I guess, and yeah. get some of those opportunities that uh, I felt like I had been excluded from previously because I was an outsider in Northern California and not part of that scene and not like at the industry parties, you know, yeah, yeah. kissing butt with the right people and all that kind of thing. And so I think that there was definitely a little of that outsider's perspective to most of the stuff that I did in the beginning. And, yeah, and they weren't Largely necessarily small. Too. I remember at one point, I think Surfer had a million subscribers, uh, you know, in it or something like that. I mean, They'd tell you that, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not really right. sure. I mean, yeah, you know, who knows? It's come full it's, circle in that, like, uh, now almost everything I do is for print, yeah. and uh, it's really just about the space. Available. So you write a lot now for this, the Surfer's Journal. Yeah, that's right. Which is actually the. I mean, how would you describe it compared to the others now? I mean, it's at a different level. Yeah, I mean, it certainly aims to be. Uh, if surfing is for a 12-year-old and surfers for a 20-year-old, surfers journal is for the, the guy who's in his 30s, 40s, 50s, perhaps has a family and other interests in life and, you know, um, isn't just uh, relying on his parents for gas money to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. um, so it's slightly more erudite in that nature. But I, th I think that, you know, they're attempting to be much more authentic in their coverage of the sport, like that they're really just trying to look at what's actually happening in, in, in front of them uh, in the surf world, what's actually interesting and people that are interesting and characters that are interesting, as opposed to the magazines, which really are driven by this need to commercialize surfing and sell product. I mean, the whole existence of those surf magazines is about having uh, companies that sell clothing and you yeah, know, uh, accessories related to surfing perpetuate their existence and market themselves to people. So mm -hmm. Surfer's Journal is subscriber-based. Uh, that's where it's supported. And um, it, 
it exists a little bit more to the side of the, the, the commercial thing going on. Um, so in that way, for me, it's probably the smallest audience of like uh, any of the major American magazines, but they allow you the most space. Yeah. So well, for, for me, that's become important, that ability to like have room to tell a story, not just to have everything limited to 800 words, which is essentially what online is. You know, that like, uh, there's a given with most online content that no one's going to have the stamina to read for more than 800 words. <laughs> it's, a, it's true. So. And this, I mean, it's a, it's a high quality publication. It costs a lot of money, too, to buy and so forth. It's, yeah, and hence very it's few people read it. people, yeah. Right. So you say about roughly feathers, would you, right. would you, I mean, it's, would you say that in some ways you really kind of broke out in that regard with a uh, online presence called PostSurf that you started in yeah. terms of ruffling feathers. So when did you start that and why? Well, I had been doing stuff for Surfline that was more about writing about uh, professional surfers, like critiquing their performances uh, after the contests. And uh, previously, it had been this very advertorial coverage of the contest, this sense of kind of like uh, everyone did great. The guy who finished last, he did great. You know, he's a great surfer. Like, good job. And then the guy who finished first, also great. Everyone's great because all of them are representing these companies, and the companies are the ones who buy the advertisements, and the advertisements are what pay the bills for the writer of the magazine. So. It's a small enough world that everyone has to be great because they all see each other at the end of the day, you know? And uh, I kind of came in and said, oh, wait, you know, that guy, no, you're not doing great. You're in last place after 10 events, and, you know, you haven't made it through one heat all year. And um, kind of dug in a little bit on critiquing people's performances, which was pretty foreign at that point for the sport, like uh, to a large degree as opposed to other athletes who are used to this every single day after every, you know, uh, after every game, people get ripped apart in the general sports press. But in surfing, it came across as being kind of odd and, you know, I, I think exciting for fans at that time to get to see people taking a task for stuff that they hadn't been. Um, and you upset some of them. Yeah, certainly. I definitely, uh, so when I'd run so into Matt, the guys at the contests, yeah. they would be. And I'm taking the long way to explaining the, the website you mentioned, Post Surf. But um, the point is, is that uh, in the course of writing about professional surfing for Surfline, they had to go to bat for me a, a ton of times when advertisers would have issues with what I had written, um, disparaging one of their team riders, uh, and uh, or the team rider would have issues with what I had written and complain yeah, to I mean, Matt, Surfline. Matt Warshaw quoted once saying, uh, "To you, it's not okay what you do. I'm going to pound your face unless you leave right now." Right, some guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I uh, that a common occurrence uh, <laughs> and. Um, Happened. I've had that conversation many times with uh, some of the most famous professional surfers <laughs> in the world, and it's an odd thing. I mean, like when it comes down to it, that like I was still that kid going, like, I don't. Why would you even care what I wrote? You know, like I can't even believe. Yeah. It's amazing that you even read that stuff. You know, and of course they're human beings; they read it. Um, but certainly at the time when I first started out, I was just baffled that they would care at all, like what my perspective was on their performance. Um, any well, more critiquing than critiquing surfing is, I mean, I, I've always thought it difficult myself. I mean, the old saying is the best surfer in the water at any one time is the guy who's having the most fun, right? Right. That was the old right. statement. So, contests to me always seem bizarre. To, I mean, you can tell when something's oh, yeah. great kind of thing. But, you know, when I was growing up, the contests, the big contests were in Huntington just up. And the only, you know, I never went to one. I just didn't care. I liked it when there was a contest because that meant there were less people in the water down in our zone. <laughs> right. 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 No, but, a professional surf contest is a little bit like. Uh, you know, to a certain degree, like uh, the spectacle almost re resembles kind of when they have those like uh, those contests to win a car or something in the 1950s where you're supposed to like dance for 24 hours straight or something like that. It's like, it's a gimmick, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to put structure on something that doesn't really have structure. It totally just comes down to the variables of the ocean. And the reason they're trying to create that structure is to be able to tell stories about athletes that would then, again, you know, help them promote the sport and sell the products. So that like, they're taking something that's a hundred percent subjective to a certain degree and trying to make it objective and say that we have a winner at the end of the day because then there's the most famous surfer in the world, you know, like otherwise how would you know? There's just yeah. like a bunch of guys who well, surf well. So how do you know when you're critiquing? I mean it's not like there's a stopwatch some you know, seconds in the tube or something like that. You know, so Yeah, you know, it's I mean, not it's... objective measures of uh, performance. Uh, it's like figure skating at the end of the day. In the same way that after every Olympics, you know, there's like 
they turns out that oh the Russian judge was swayed by this and there's always all that that uh, controversy as to any decision because it, it seems completely subjective but then at the end of the day even an amateur can watch like figure skaters and when somebody's really at an exceptional level in any like athletic endeavor like you can sense it and they find ways to differentiate themselves despite the uh, variables involved in the activity despite how hard it is with the ocean you know that like no one gets a, a level playing field mm -hmm. um, and so, not just in contests, but in surfing in general, how would you say, I mean, the style really changed over the decades, became a lot more aggressive, uh, aerials and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, is that, I mean, what's that about, really? Is that just people trying to stand out more, uh, you know, more methamphetamine out there? I don't, you know. <laughs> With big wave surfers, yes. That's a, that's a we can get to that later. Uh, there's a rich tradition of big wave surfers uh, being on drugs in order to feel like they're like in other sports, like in other sports, <laughs> but it's a little bit less performance enhancing and yes. more just kind of like uh, getting them in the mood to go risk their lives. Um, but that's a different story. I, I think in terms of uh, actual performance surfing, you know, it's just like anything else. That like, uh, how do you express mastery over this act? You know, how do you show that you can do things that the average surfer can't? When the waves are life-threatening, um, it's just obvious based on pure positioning in the waves. You know, like you're literally taking off somewhere on a wave that a normal person would be terrified to take off. If you think of it like skiing or something, it's like going to the very steepest part of the mountain and just going straight down through the rocks. But if the waves aren't life-threatening, if it's just an average day at any beach, uh, then you got to relate your skills through the hot dog stuff. And the hot dog stuff is what you're talking about. Sure like. In the 60s, it was hanging 10, you know, and on longboards. And in the modern era, it's doing, uh, you know, 360 aerials. Uh, and that that's the way that guys show that they're really just much better at this than anyone else. So it's not functional in the same way. Um, it's just about saying, hey, look, look what I can do, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a little kid showing off. Yeah, like on a skateboard. Uh, yeah, right. My, my daughter's three. She rides a scooter, and um, she calls it her trick style. And I don't know where she picked this up, but she, she puts her leg up in there like a flamingo and rides her scooter and says, look, trick style. <laughs> and that's all it is, you know? So once you got going with Post Surf, uh, yeah. Surfline, your previous uh, employer or a writer, they, they actually terminated your... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a long, not particularly interesting story yeah, in some ways, sure. but in, in others it is in that like, uh, I just had this conversation a lot of times with the editors uh, at Surfline where they're like, we, we can't print that, you know, like we can't put that up because the advertiser is going to be unhappy. And uh, I just got sick of having that conversation. So it was easy enough to go, you know, buy a URL and pay for hosting and put up my own website. And I started just printing my own articles on my own website because I didn't want to have that conversation with an editor anymore about like what you can and can't do. And uh, it's a great thing at first, you know, there's a lot of freedom involved, but uh, also to a certain extent, like uh, it just kind of became its own beast. Um, but for a while, uh, when I was first doing it, it, w it definitely kind of rang true for people and felt fresh and authentic in a way that the rest of surf media hadn't because everything had been so cliched and so uh, just paint by numbers in order to, you know, please the advertisers. Um, I mean, really, at the end of the day, like, I I've been in those offices at those magazines, and the decisions are made by the publisher. The publisher often is the guy who just answers to the advertisers, and the editor works for the publisher. And uh, if you're, like, a writer down the food chain sitting in that office, you're just working for the publisher at the end of the day. And you might as well be paid by one of the clothing companies like Quicksilver or something like that. So. It's a little different than you know working for the New York Times. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and you get uh, online, you get that interactive thing too. So right. Surfline is still up. You can still go look at it, even though you stopped it in what year? Post surf. Post surf. Post -surf. Yeah. I'm sorry. Post surf. Uh, yeah, um, it's still up there. Yeah, I probably should take it down one of these days. No, honestly. No, it's, um, it's just, I mean, so I mean, I looked, it's like last, an artifact. Last time I looked, yeah, it's a, and there was one piece. Maybe it was the farewell one. Right. It had a thousand plus comments on it. And so you had a following of people who love to argue. Right. It was a following of people who love to argue. And what was unusual about it uh, was that it was the, the audience was largely the people in the industry, um, which was what was so odd about it. You know, I got, I was trying to get away from that idea of the industry, like dictating what I could and couldn't say. But then my audience, more than being like the everyday surfer, like these magazines, my, my audience was largely the actual industry people. So 
they were writing in under pseudonyms, fake like names, yeah. fake names, defending their own honor, you know, like, and uh, they didn't understand I could like see the same IP address attached to the comment <laughs> as they had when they had written in as themselves saying like, oh no, you know, like what, here at Transworld Surf, we're trying to do this or that. And, you know, like uh, you should really give us a chance. We're just doing our job. And, and they would write in with some other comment from, you know. Surfer yeah, Joe to, saying. It's like you threw out the match, and then, I mean, these guys are arguing with themselves. It's a, I mean, literally, one of them had a thousand comments going down. Yeah, these people it, had been at each other's throats. It turned into <laughs> its own thing. And this was kind of pre uh, Twitter uh, having a large influence in the surfing community, at least. Twitter existed. But, like, uh, people weren't used to this as much as they are now. I mean, like, it seemed much more novel. This was back in 2008 or something. So it seemed like a little bit more of a thing to people at that point. And, uh, I, I think if I had done it now in you know, 2015, it wouldn't have the same impact at all because it's uh, a different era where a lot of this is going on in social media uh, in terms of the back and forth between uh, people in the industry and professional surfers and uh, the everyday surfer. And um, I mean, what's odd about it again is that they respond or that they care. You know, like if you have somebody like, uh, you know, A-Rod or, you know, like can you imagine Michael Jordan in the day really taking the time to like, go onto a website and defend his honor if somebody said you had a bad game with the Bulls. You know, you're Michael Jordan. Like, you don't need to do that. Yeah, but um, you said things like, so this is out of Matt Warshaw, is at the encyclopedia. He said, uh, surf like he was in the Special Olympics. <laughs> he reminds me of Charles Dickens if Dickens were a Sydney metrosexual comfortable in the company of a young Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, if the person could understand you, why do you think they were mad? <laughs> In the case of that guy, actually, if I remember correctly, that was a gentleman named Luke Stedman who was uh, trying to break into the top ten in surfing. That was, you know, his his deal. But he was also a male model and spending most of his time <laughs> devoted to that. And uh, he actually went to therapy at, at a very expensive sports psychologist in Sydney based on the stuff I had written about. Him. <laughs> and I I ran into him in Bali and. <laughs> You know, went up and said, hey, look, I, I think that, you know, I just want to clear the air here. Like, maybe you feel like I owe you an apology. And uh, he really lost it when, I, you know, his friend was laughing and just couldn't believe it. They were like, his friend had clearly been talking about this moment and the potential of it coming someday with this guy ad nauseum. Like, they had really thought about it. And uh, he didn't know what to do. Um, we mostly ended up repairing the relationship so to speak. But uh, yeah, I guess he had gone to therapy for the whole thing, that it, it was something that, uh, you know, which I don't feel great about. I don't want to cause the guy pain and suffering in his life. But at the same time, he's a professional athlete. Like, you have to be able to withstand criticism and improve yourself. And it's been interesting to see that some of the guys in surfing really took it that way, you know, like uh, the guys who are the best for the most part, you know, like in surfing, there's Kelly Slater. And Kelly Slater's won more world titles than anyone. He's won whatever it is, you know, 11. 12, 12, dozen, dozen, yeah. 12. And uh, when I first started writing about him, uh, he started emailing me and uh, kind of saying, oh, well, you know, what do you have to say before this contest? And I realized really quickly that what he was trying to do was use it as ammunition, that like he was going to just, this is the kind of thing that had been firing him up since he was seven years old, was people telling him that he wasn't good enough and that he, he couldn't do things. And uh, that had gotten him to his first contest win, it had gotten him to his first world title, it had gotten him to his seventh world title, his eighth world title, and so on and so forth. And this was right around when he was going for eight or nine. And uh, yeah, it, he totally used his ammunition. He would literally, I get emails from him literally five minutes before he was about to paddle out for a heat. <laughs> and uh, I'm watching the contest because they, they put him online. You know, you can just watch these things as they're happening live. And it's as if, you know, you had like uh, Michael Jordan, again, like texting you from the sideline being, all right, so what do you think, you know? And he's not looking for compliments. You You're know? like the unpaid coach in the corner of like the boxing ring or something. You should, you know, you should have been charging him. I've played that role with some people <laughs> in their career, and then I've played the role again of like the guy that is just absolutely detested by these professional surfers. Mm -hmm. That uh, some, they look at it different ways. But uh, it certainly was an odd thing for a kid from Linus to like suddenly have these guys who, you know, especially the older ones who I grew up watching as a kid, and suddenly uh, interested in what I had to say. Definitely very odd. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like there's a certain insecurity there underneath this fame, and you know, what are they really doing? You know, right. What is it? Is it? Well, I think that's universal. You know, that's not just surfing. That's yeah. anything that um, if you dug deep enough and you got a chance to speak to a lot of these people who succeeded anything in life, I think that's one of the things you realize is that a lot of it is driven by insecurity. But um, 
cool. that that's that's yeah. what drives them to succeed in general, you know, and that uh, that that's why they're going to be more sensitive about criticism than other people, and it's also why they're going to thrive on sometimes on that criticism in order to be able to like use it as fuel to keep doing what they do. So, well, surfing it, it's always, or at least till more recent years, in some ways still always had an image, a self-cultivated image as outsiders, a subculture, counterculture, right. even you know. Um, before the real commercialization and everything, and it still seems to try to maintain that in some way, but you seem to think that that's uh, a load of hooey. I think it's largely gone, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, hopefully some of the people who care about surfing's past who keep like the flame of the, the culture alive, you know, whether it's somebody like me who's writing about it, um, they, they want it to still have some of that Counterculture authenticity that you know this originally uh, was depending on what you want to believe either like you know Peruvians coming in on reed rafts after fishing uh, were surfing or the Hawaiians were surfing and then it got squashed out by the missionaries in Hawaii and uh, you know it was too too uh, likely to lead to fornic fornication because people didn't have their clothes on when they were surfing <laughs> literally and um, and then it came back a little bit. And it, it took root post-war, you know. Uh, and at that point, it was really about disenfranchised people who looked at that 1950s American culture and didn't feel like it was the place for them. You know, the conformity, the idea of having a straightforward suburban life with a family and, you know, uh, shiny things. They didn't want to do it. They wanted to be sitting in the dirt at the beach and leading a different type of life. And I think that, you know, certainly a lot of the people in Bolinas can relate to that, whether they surf or not, this idea that, like, they didn't want that life. They wanted this other thing. And uh, that's how surfing felt to me when I started doing it, and I think it's how it felt to a lot of people. Like, you had discovered some little, you know, respite from that less authentic American life. But largely to uh, most people now, I think it is just like golf or anything else, that, like, you're going out into... Or I guess skiing is a better analogy, you know, that like uh, you're seeing that pervade the, the perspective of beginner surfers now more and more, that they're going to go out there and, you know, like on the slopes, the slowest skier has the right of way, right? That like you have to give way to the worst skier on the mountain. That's the job of the better skier. But in surfing, that wasn't the way it used to be, you know. It was like the worst surfer had to get out of the way of the good surfers. And uh, it was like a, you know, somewhat fringe counterculture dangerous thing and like uh as you get the surf schools and um it's great that it's turned into this egalitarian sport that everyone gets to do and when i go to work now you know like i have a normal job and uh everyone wants to talk about surfing now you know they're like oh that's so cool you surf you know like i surf too i i took a lesson on my vacation in nicaragua and mm -hmm. so on and so forth it, it's become something that everyone does as opposed to a thing that like you know, my parents pretty much warned me away from it when I was a kid. It was like joining a biker gang or something like that. You know? say, right. It was just going to lead to uh, a misspent youth, which is largely accurate. Um, <laughs> well, you actually wrote, you wrote a great piece in Surfer a couple years ago on a culture of cool, it was called. And you're talking about just right. that and how there's something of a resurgence or this, you know, the, you know everybody. There's, there's, a, there's always been a real... I mean, you know, the famous saying in surfing, you should have been here yesterday, but it also applies. You should have been here 10 years ago. You should have been here in the 60s or whatever. Even when I was a kid, in the 70s surfing, it was like it was cooler back right. then, you know. Right. And it was really aligned a lot with the whole the hippie thing in a way, um, in terms of drugs and everything, the music that was listened to and all of that. Um, and, you know, there seems to be an attraction there that's, that's somehow innate at least in California and in Australia and a few other places, that that's what people look at surfing and surfers as being forever. Right. You know? and, and then also there's the, too, the common you know? misnomer is that there's a, there's a certain level of like spiritual um, you know, insight that goes along with being a surfer that we've unlocked, like you, you joked in the beginning, secrets of the universe by being out in the water and learning how to catch waves, which is totally, you know... <laughs> untrue. Um, all surfers have learned how to do is like dodge responsibility in order to like perform this selfish act religiously day after day after day after day. Like that, that's what they've learned. I mean, there's, there's no, uh, there's some level of uh, insight into the workings of the 
the natural world that you get from paying such close attention to them. And the same can be true for fishing or anything else where you have to like pay diligent attention to, you know, that just the atmospheric conditions around you in order to be in the right place at the right time to catch a fish or shoot a buck or whatever it is. But in that way, I think it's like closer to uh, some of that instinctual things like hunting that people maybe don't do so much anymore. But once they do something that ties into that feeling, they get that sense that they're they're like doing something real and authentic in their life. Mm -hmm. But certainly the best surfers have no spiritual insight that I can see. I mean, it's like really. Well, what, what you wrote a. It's a stunted great. growth, these humans. I mean, like in terms of intellectually, like everything else. They've, they've just focused so much on this one thing in their life because they're so obsessed with it. Uh, and that goes for myself, of course, too. You know, that like mm -hmm. the whole world around them, all these other things that have brought so much joy to so many people. And like you think about that you know, world of science and people standing on the shoulders of everyone who came before them, driving forward, you know, human thought. And like, all you're doing is like paddling around on a surfboard and catching waves. And bro, that last one was so sick. I got so barreled, you know, like that's what you're doing. Well, you wrote about having kind of an identity crisis when our, our mutual friend, Matt, the, right. the um, he's been called the omniscient guru of surf writing or surf, you know, historian. And he told you it was basically just a very prolonged uh, habit of masturbation. I know so, he said that in print and, and before. It, and he's largely quit, strangely enough. Um, surfing. Surfing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the other thing. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, uh, yeah. I see his point, certainly. But I had, I had come to a, a similar conclusion just in terms of like the, the futility of the act to a large degree long before. Yeah. I think he, he put that in print somewhere. Um, I mean, you do wonder at the end of the day, like, what, what does it all add up to? You know, like, you spend a lifetime doing it, and uh, hopefully you try to examine on some level whether it is actually of worth as a human activity or whether you've just found a really fun way to entertain yourself until the, the curtain, you know? Like, it's worth thinking about. Um, but I think the same could be said of a, a lot of other things in life, you know? Well, it's true, and also it's something that in general is healthy. Right. I mean, and, that's, you know, the only thing, fun. the only thing that makes like the intervention thing <laughs> not accurate is the fact that in general surfing is fairly healthy. And I say that as somebody who, you know, is sitting here with like freshly healed stitches across my face from a board that shot up and lodged itself up into my eyelid mm -hmm. two weeks ago. And, you know, we're like going out there and, um, massively polluted water in San Francisco. And, uh, you see, they put up the signs that say like, you know, combined sewage overflow, like call this number. And like literally all of the sewer water from San Francisco has been let out during the last storm and the lineup's packed. You know, there's just like hundreds of people out there. And, uh, and they're out there not only like potentially exposing themselves to, you know, really harmful viruses or bacteria or anything else, but like they're doing it while their like children sit at home, like wondering where daddy is. And <laughs> They're doing it while their boss is like, God, I'm going to fire that guy. I'm just sick of this, you know? I think it's in here somewhere. Isn't that it? Right. So, yeah. um, it, just speaking of dangers, I have to ask, have you ever had yeah. an encounter with the guy we call the landlord, sharks here? I mean, this is where, here we are in the triangle yeah. you know, where they are. So I've had plenty. I mean, we're, we're, in, uh, we're in the right place to have those experiences. And uh, I think... Um, you've seen... You've, yeah, I've seen them. I've seen my a, a friend be attacked by a great white shark in front of me. Um, Where was that? That was uh, just south of Bodega Bay. And uh, then another time when I was a kid, I, one of my other friends was launched into the air by a great white when it just came up and hit him on the bottom of his board without biting him, just like a, a puppy wanting to play. And, you know, you're sitting there looking out to the lineup and suddenly you see your friend like literally fly 10 feet up into the air and an explosion of white water. That was here? Uh, was no, that was uh, Point Reyes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's unusually sharky here, yeah. um, certainly. And I, I've known a lot of guys, you know, Bellinas guys, Lee Lenz, who I went to school with and uh, Lee surfed a lot less than me growing up. And uh, he got attacked by a great white shark right in downtown Bellinas and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it happens, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was out at Stinson about 10, maybe, I don't remember the year, 10 years ago when the guy got, <laughs> the guy got hit on a boogie board. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, the, you know, they airlifted him out. The, uh, 
networks were here, like within 20 minutes, it seemed, the vans, and they were going out to try to ask people, and they said, aren't you scared to be out here? And it was a dumb quick, I said, no, one less guy in the water. And that was, you know, so, and then the guy just looked at me and said, well, actually, no, what I mean is, right. this, the dangerous part about surfing here is driving to the beach where, from wherever you're from, I mean, yeah. statistically speaking, but then the guy just, that wasn't what they wanted to hear. You know, statistically you know. speaking, I really don't think it's true. Like, <laughs> I, I try to make myself feel better with the idea that, like, the probability of getting attacked isn't, like, whatever percentage, it's like one or zero, you know, that like you're either going to get attacked by a shark or you're not. And you can certainly do things to put yourself at risk, but at the end of the day, like it's a yes or no proposition. Um, but that said, the whole thing about, oh, you're more likely to get attacked by lightning, you're more likely to, you know, get attacked by a bear while you're hit by lightning than get attacked by a great white shark, whatever it is, that holds true for like the general population, you know, who statistically X number of people go surfing in a year and, uh, for them, that might be the case. But for somebody who surfs like north of here every day, you know, there's like five guys I know who've been attacked in a community of like how many? You know, like a hundred or something. It's pretty bad odds. And if you're one of the guys who's out there, if you're out a lot, yeah, every single day. I mean, I've I've talked to the naturalists uh, working out of Bodega Marine Lab, and they're doing the sensor data. And um, you know, they, they used to before they tagged the sharks and before they had silhouettes of seals, they literally would go right up north of the tip of Point Reyes and on a Boston whaler take a, uh, an old surfboard that uh, Chuck Alexander, like a, a local surfer, would give them his old boards. They'd put them in the water and they'd just pull them back on a rope. And they'd sit there drinking Budweiser. And usually it took about a six pack before a great white would hit the board unbaited. Chumming. chumming. No chumming. <laughs> no, I was like, with the board. Just with the board. Chumming. That's the chum. No, yeah, no chum right. in the water, no nothing. Just. The board being in the water here in the ocean and being pulled back to the boat was enough that like a great white would investigate usually within a six pack of beer being opened. You know, it took them an hour, something like that. Right. And uh, he gave me the stats for an article I did once. It was a, a guy named Scott Anderson who's a naturalist up there. It's pretty scary. I mean, it literally is like once every 1.5 hours on average in the ocean directly off the tip of Point Reyes, like a surfboard that is out there should be attacked by a great white shark. And so that's like pretty bad yeah. odds. <laughs> in the scheme of things. Um, definitely, it's not as bad in downtown Bolinas um, as it is up there. And it's right. actually not that bad at all in Ocean Beach, I think, yeah. unfortunately. And then further south where they <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, didn't you write a piece about that in some way, population control via shark or something like that? You know, I just think there's something to be said for the idea that uh, how many people get to put themselves back in the food chain, you know? Like, <laughs> if you really are looking to tap into the elemental, like, uh, you know, there's people who might have to worry about getting eaten by bears in the Pacific Northwest and other places, and people might have to worry about getting eaten by a tiger, and, you know, Southeast Asia are very small little pockets left, or elephants, or rhinos, or whatever, but, like, it's not that many people left in the world who really have to think about that stuff, and uh, there is something, it keeps you honest, you know, I think it really does keep you understanding that life is inherently a risky business, and that you should be thankful for the time you're given, and so on and so forth. That, like, uh, I think we fool ourselves into thinking that we have much more control over our our fate and our safety than we do in this modern world. And whether it's the car accident that you mentioned on the way to the beach, or like a great white attacking you when you're out in the water, there's something to be said for understanding that you should be scared of having it all come to a close soon enough. You know that like you should lead, lead your life as if that could happen at any moment because that's the truth. You know. Um. <laughs> Borrowed Boards. Mm -hmm. You wrote a series called Borrowed Boards. Tell us about what that was about. Well, it was uh, more recently. It was more recently, yeah. Um, it was uh, a solution to the whole issue of how do you go on your honeymoon without bringing surfboards. Um, so uh, my wife and I, after our marriage, uh, planned a really long trip around the world, a bunch of months. And uh, I knew it just wasn't going to really fly to like start this trip by packing a board bag with five boards and, you know, taking it to the airport and saying, all right, let's go on the honeymoon. Great, you know. Um, and also just it's too expensive these days, like literally to fly flight after flight after flight. We were going to do little flights from country to country all over Europe. And uh, it just wasn't logistically feasible to travel yeah, on trains and for stuff. A board? I mean, when I started, it was free. But what it's Russian it? roulette. You go to the yeah. airport and uh, you show up with a board bag and you, you try really nice, uh, try to be really nice to the, you know, person at the desk and ask about her family and on and on, you know, and you might get charged nothing or you might get charged like literally $900. I mean, you just yeah. don't know. Um, 
yeah. because if you read the fine print, usually there's some way that they can really add on the charges. Right. So I settled on this idea for this trip we did of uh, just borrowing boards everywhere I went, that I was just going to show up at the beach, and if there was waves, I would find a surfer, and I'd say to that surfer, like, I'm here on my honeymoon, and uh, you know, I really want to go surfing, and I don't have a surfboard. Can, can I use your board for 10 minutes or half an hour or whatever? And, um, it totally worked, like, you know, from Greece to Ireland to Thailand to uh, Sumatra. Like, everywhere I went, there was people who were happy to just, you know, they knew what it felt like to see a wave and want to go surfing and totally sympathize with my plight. And uh, everywhere I went, someone would hand me a surfboard. And uh, I took photos of the guys and the girls who loaned me boards and um, wrote about it for Surfer Magazine in the end. And I think, uh, you know, after however many months on the road, um, it was a slim profit on the honeymoon. After I sold it to Australian magazines and Japanese magazines and Brazilian magazines. and um, It was a, a plan that didn't make much sense when I first thought of it that actually totally worked out. Like, uh, well, you know, in uh, the addiction world, there's this really common thing. People who are trying to stop will say, I don't have a problem anymore because I never pay for it. I just borrow cigarettes. Right. Or, yeah, right? Just right. <laughs> that was just that. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it did tap into one of the worked. it tapped into one of the nice things about surfing is that you, you can go anywhere in the world and find people who are like passionate about the same thing in life that you're passionate yeah. about. Um, I mean, really, even in landlocked places, it is amazing how you'll find surfers everywhere, and um, that you know you can kind of find your people, like uh, yeah. for better or worse. You know, you can at least sit and have a conversation with them or find common ground. And uh, it's fun to do that in, in you know faraway places, like particularly in, in Greece, where you wouldn't really expect to find waves. Um, there was these guys who their whole life was surfing, you know, like that was it. They were, uh, had this little surf shack set up on a beach on an island in the Cyclades and uh, they were waiting for the winds to get strong enough that all, all the ferries can't run and it creates a little local windswell on the Aegean Sea despite how small it is and they would go surfing, you know, and they were in some ways much more in touch with like what it is to be a surfer and the joys of surfing than most of the guys you'll find at a beach in Southern California or Hawaii or places where the sports just become like uh, so self-referential and lost touch with kind of like just the, the basic elements of itself. You know, it's become much more of the industry and the the commerce attached to it. Um, so it was fun to see that like, you know, no matter where you go, there's people who have that that same passion. The surf travel has become a huge industry now too. I mean, you've been yeah. a fair amount, but it's it's all over the world, you know, whether it's in package tours or just people finding their own way into it. And a lot of that has been aided now by the internet. You can find spots all over that used to be, you know, right. secret spots no longer and everything. But um, do you think this is really, I mean, we, we've both been in Indonesia, say, to go to Bali. I mean, years ago, it was the most beautiful, isolated culture, you know, not that long ago. Right. And now you go to some of the main surf spots. I mean, you might as well be in Malibu, you know, or something like that. And I mean, do you feel like it has an impact on the local culture there that's... Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, it's tremendous. I mean, I mean I, it's commercial in some ways. It's good. They make some money off of it, but... Right. You know. I, yeah, I've seen it happen in, in small uh, towns in Indonesia that I traveled to when I was younger and then went back to over the years. And, um, you know, d depending on your perspective, it can be like a, a total tragic erosion of a local culture based on surfers coming in. You know, the first couple guys came in the 80s or 70s in parts of Indonesia, and they... Um, you know, brought those magazines and slept in a little lawsman on the beach somewhere and local family cooked for them and it was all great. And then like the years go on and suddenly, you know, they put up a concrete shack next to the local lawsman and they're looking at the magazines and you're going, well, God, this is what we need here is, you know, we need some like, uh, we need a place, a nightclub to go out at night, you know, and like, can you guys start, you know, bringing in some some stuff like beer for us here, you know, it'd be really better if we had beer and soda, you know, like, then how about, you know, God, this town needs some prostitutes, and like, you know, is, can, can I get heroin here? And, and it literally snowballs until you have like this like surf ghetto, and that's what happened in places like Nias and uh, Lugundri Bay and Sumatra, where, uh, I mean, it actually went and rounded the corner where like you went from this like idyllic little paradise to like a a ghetto of concrete buildings that had all been set up as businesses to cater towards surfers as this gold rush of people coming for the waves came. And uh, then you started getting people uh, selling drugs to the surfers and the surfers started uh, 
the same drug dealers who would sell the drugs would like do a sting operation with the police and get a kickback from the police to like bust the surfers after they sold them the drugs. So surfers stopped coming because they're like, don't go there. The police will shake you down. And it fell out of favor in the surfing community and everyone stopped coming. And why like, did, Why didn't Bellinas think of this? Yeah, it's an idea. <laughs> And so it went through that whole evolution where it was like this big, booming, you know, gold rush town because of surfing, and then everyone left, and, and like you were literally let now left with uh, this like local village where the people had, um, you know, totally given up the values they had when they began the whole process, and um, were addicted to drugs themselves, and like yeah, yeah. it was not a great scene, and that happens in places because of surfing. It happened in Mexico even. Yeah, it happens in places in Mexico, and. Certainly, the, the the people of the village are uh, encouraged to you know like hold the surfing lifestyle up on a pedestal when like a lot of the people who are coming in there really are just like uh, especially the expats. You know, it's like a classic expat thing that wherever you go in the surf world and you find these expat people living in those communities, nine times out of ten they're running from something. I mean, like literally, it's like very few people actually give up their life and move somewhere just on the basis of like the waves are so good. They usually have some other screwed up thing in their past that gets them there. And they're the ones who actually embed themselves in the community and stay there forever and like are that leading light of like what a surfer is. Right. And become the locals that make it unpleasant for others sometimes. Right. And then they become self proclaimed locals. Yeah. You right. go to Costa Rica now and there's locals from Texas everywhere who are yeah, yeah. you know telling you it's their wave. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Um. <laughs> it's a dark sport, you know, largely. It's not all well, no, you know, so they, it's I, not I, all fun and games. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things you wrote here, truth is, surfing is an often a dark, anarchic, angry act. It's a selfish pursuit swarmed by a menagerie of morons. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, some people got yeah. mad at you. you I'm um, just another one of those morons, you know. <laughs> yeah. I got, here I am, I'm still doing it. Um, so on your travels, you still you still do it, and you've done a lot of it. So yeah. So let's, let's, let's play, uh, like, uh, ten favorites or, you know, that kind of thing. You know, what, what's the, what's the uh, well, we'll do, make it easier, five. Five favorite waves in the world you've ever been on? Well, probably the top two or so I couldn't tell you about in public forum. I mean, like, that's, I still hold somewhat true to my roots. That, like, okay, good. You try not to. Local uh, spots, other than those. Right, other than those, uh, the last 10 years I've spent a ton of time in Chile, and Chile is great. It's uh, a lot like southern Chile, not like the Atacama Desert. Like, I'm not really a desert person. Um, I like having trees and green stuff around me when I go surfing, and Southern Chile looks just like Big Sur, uh, except that there's like a world-class wave every two miles when you get to certain stretches of coast down there. And uh, it's taken longer because the water's cold like here. So uh, it's that similar thing that just like, you know, when we were growing up around here, everyone thought, oh, it's too cold to surf in San Francisco. You know, that's what you would hear from people who surfed other places in the world. And so Chile still has a little bit of that going for it, that people think it's just freezing cold like Patagonia, and it's not uh, in some parts. Um, Indonesia. Uh, I spent a ton of time in Indonesia um, in my early 20s. and That's a big place, like particular where? Um, Sumatra, Manawai Islands. Um, that's another place that I've seen change a lot over the years, but is really uh, pretty magical, uh, like 100 kilometers off the coast of Sum northern Sumatra. And um, Tahiti is still amazing, um, worth going to. No uh, mention of Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is a really short plane flight, and that's really great when uh, you don't have much time and you have kids and things like that. And uh, it is a totally, totally beautiful place. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like uh, in general, there's a lot of animosity in the water in Hawaii because what's left of the local surfing population feels like what has been theirs has been co-opted by, you know, visitors. And uh, they already had their land taken and the you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and now guys are coming and taking their waves too. And to a certain degree, I agree with them. And it's like, I'm happy to leave Hawaii be and go other places and try to find a little more space. Mm -hmm. How about surfers? Those are the five, I can't say best because I don't believe in that, five favorite of all time. Ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I was a sucker for some of the old guys from the, the 50s and 60s, like Mickey Dora, who was a uh, career con man and um, really defined that idea of kind of the surfer scoundrel, I think, and uh, was finding ways to 
slipstream off the Hollywood set in Malibu. And then, he was a Malibu local. Yeah, yeah, Malibu guy in the 50s and 60s and making money off the movie industry. And I mean, literally like was on the FBI most wanted list for many years uh, until he was finally picked up and did prison time. And um, you know, just the stories about him are so outlandish. He's definitely a character. Um, from that same era, Greg Knoll, who was a guy who was a big wave rider and um, just really had that attitude to kind of like, you know, he was going to go out and risk his life in conditions that were pretty dangerous. Um, and he's a guy who quit. Yeah, he quit. And at, I, I appreciated that, too. He walked yeah. away at the top of his game, which is almost never happens in surfing. Um, more modern era, uh, there was a guy named Derek Hind, who was an Australian who uh, competed on the Pro Tour and uh, then wrote about surfing. And uh, a lot of the work I did earlier in my career definitely owed a lot to him. Um, and uh, more modern era, Kelly Slater is just incredible as a surfer. You can't get away from it. He's the guy who's won the most. And, you know, it is a uh, subjective sport. But still, like, it, it does speak to a level of skill above everyone else. Yeah. And, uh, God, I don't know about another five. Steve Radcliffe he's sitting right there. <laughs> How about, uh, were you, did you ever get into uh, surf movies very much? I mean, these were an interesting The Hollywood thing. surf movies? You no, know? no, I mean, real surf films. I yeah. Mean, as a, you know, as a whole genre. And these were a big, you know, even though I never wanted to watch surf contests, it was always a big social event. At, you know, when a new movie would come out, right. we'd go and sneak beer in and yell and scream and run around. And, you know, and it was always really fun. Yeah, something from a different era, and really. They, I mean, yeah. it, it, there wasn't as much of it up here when I was a kid. It was already yeah. kind of gone. Um, in the, but you've seen them. The yeah. classics and everything. Yeah, right? for sure. And you know, I've been to the theaters and had people trying to recreate that same experience. But um, <laughs> definitely what you're saying is true that like uh, you can't um, overstate like how ridiculous of a scene it was to go to a surf movie in like the previous era that like a normal movie theater where people, you know, wouldn't speak during a film, like you go in there and it was just absolute chaos, you know, like people sneaking in alcohol and drugs and throwing things at the screen and screaming and hooting and like just all but ripping the place down during a two hour surf movie because they were so crazed at seeing these images of like the latest waves from, you know, Bali or right. Hawaii or whatever it was. And I think culturally they're an interesting thing in, in that way that, you know, it's just part of that whole hedonistic like surfer thing. Um, but a lot of the films themselves I think are pretty poor. I mean, it's like one of those things that uh, even a great surfer, you can only watch so much surfing before it's boring. You know, yeah. like you just want to go surfing yourself. You're like, okay, great. I can see you, you do it. That's awesome. You know, like the waves are good, but I can't yeah, see it anymore. Yeah, Laguna, they used to show them. It was a Saturday night at midnight after the regular movie. Right. And they never made it through a movie because the cops had to be called at these things. It was, yeah. It was great. I, you know, <laughs> but they were, they were boring. And actually, a couple of years ago, they tried to start having a surf movie night downtown here, right. downtown there, and it was, you know, a lot of people came. It was kind of fun, but it kind of died out. I mean, it's, like you say, there's only so much you can watch these things. Yeah, the I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's just, writing about surfing is the same thing. Like, actually trying to write about the act of surfing usually is just, you butcher it, it's boring, it's it's not even worth doing. Like, it's the stuff that's peripheral to it that's usually more interesting. Yeah. You know, what's happening in between the moments that you're actually in the water, and the sacrifices people make in their lives, and the struggles they go through, and the, the characters and involved with the sport, like, are often much more compelling from a, a narrative perspective, whether it's writing or film, than just, like, seeing somebody on a surfboard. I mean, it's pretty boring at the end of the day. Um, and that, like, I think it's definitely, surf movies have basically been snipped up into little pieces, and it's just, like, two-minute clips on the internet yeah, now. It is. And that's all it is. I mean, it's like the, the whole idea of a two-hour surf movie doesn't hold much weight anymore. How about uh, books? Are there any particular surf-related books, surfing books that you, your favorites? Other than Matt's, of course. Right. Hi, Matt. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think there's a lot of great stuff out there from the surf literature perspective. I mean, yeah. I certainly enjoy books that are written not having to do with surfing more than I do the ones that have to do with surfing in general. I think, you know, once you know too much about something, too, like, um, it makes it a lot harder to enjoy certainly, like, fiction associated with it, you know? Ken um, Nunn, you read him? Yeah. yeah. He's a fiction writer. Right. A yeah, no, I've, I've met Cam. He's, he's a nice guy and great writer, but, like, I think I enjoy his stuff more when he's not writing about surfing. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm saying that, like, you, you just see the stuff that doesn't quite ring true um, when you're too close to the activity. Yeah. Um, and in that way, I think a lot of the writing that's been done about surfing, it's harder to, like, disassociate and 
have that perspective of just like enjoying learning about something new because like a lot of it just rehashes stuff that I've read somewhere else. And how about surf music? Did you ever listen to that? It was an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Growing up yeah. in Newport Beach and with all my friends and you know everybody surf, but I never knew a surfer who was into the Beach Boys or surf music. Yeah, I hated the Beach Boys when I was a kid. I, I have much more appreciation for Brian Wilson now, certainly, than I did when I was younger. And, and um, not necessarily the surf songs either. It was other Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, aspects, part, tracks on Pet Sounds, sure, you can't argue with it. But no, the whole surf music thing, I mean, that was just part of that whole uh, 60s era of like, surf ploitation, you know, like the Gidget thing, the Beach Boys thing. It was, uh, again, like a way to sell stuff. And um, I think in that way, like none of it really felt true to the activity at all um, for me. Like when I was a kid, every surfer I know, like listen to Jimi Hendrix, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. that was it. Like Other, other stuff. Yeah. Or, or reggae. Or punk. Yeah, reggae. Terrible Sublime album, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was surf music. It wasn't like music that was called surf music, you know? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the paddling out into the uh, sewage, et cetera. Right. Um, so it was just last year, I think it was? Or? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Surfer did, as they have done uh, occasionally, a green issue, special edition, Oceans Under Siege. I think that's the only time they've ever actually deemed the environment worthy of its own issue. <laughs> I, th I thought there was one before, but maybe, yeah, you're, you would be right. And so yeah. you, you basically, you had the lead piece in it. Um, shifting baselines into the future sadly. So you started off here, I want to read this actually. I'm not a denialist. I believe pollution exists and it's harmful. I believe global warming is happening and so too is coral reef acidification and every other oceanic environmental catastrophe that can be validated through actual scientific research. Paren, so no, I'm not worried about Fukushima radiation in California. The future is coming and the future is bleak. The continual degradation of once pristine coastal environments will undoubtedly keep having a negative impact on our surfing experience, just as it already already has. I've gotten sick from polluted water. I've been exposed to all sorts of toxins that potentially increase my risk for cancer. I've washed in disgust as trash and dead animals float by in the lineup. Um, and you go on to write that it's not enough to make you quit surfing, obviously. But um, you, the word you use is bleak. The future is bleak, right? Um, only when seen in comparison to the past, you know? I mean, I think that's the whole idea of shifting baselines and environmentalism in general, is that, like, you only notice this change when you have a way to see what was happening 50 years ago or so on and so forth, that the, the change is so gradual in our lifetimes that we just, uh, what was unacceptable for a previous generation is just, uh, you know, a slightly smoggy day for our generation. And same thing with water quality, right? That, like, as the water quality gets worse year after year, um, and there's less living in the water and all the rest of it, as opposed to people saying this is like, you know, completely unacceptable, they're just like, oh, okay, well, it was a great fishing day, you know, after 24 hours of fishing, I got one fish, you know, and like they have no memory of what previous generations to knew, knew to be the natural state of those environments. And I think the same will hold true with water quality and everything else. Like, I don't think people will stop surfing. I think people will continue utilizing the ocean regardless how bad the pollution gets. It'll just be a totally degraded experience, you know, and they won't have a way to know that. Well, so it's a, this is a personal question, really. So yeah. you, it, the future is bleak, yet at the same time you have decided in recent years to have a, have a beautiful family, to have a couple of kids. I mean, does that require a certain amount of denialism itself? Oh, yeah, of in course. In terms of the future? I mean, the, of do, course. You, do you think about that? Well, I mean, you know, it's a pretty heavy call to have kids, but it's also a pretty heavy call to say, like, those kids don't have a, a right to exist because, like, they wouldn't have as cool of a life as, like, they had if they had been born 50 years ago, you know? Like, that's, that's pretty presumptive for me to say that life isn't worth living if it's, like, a little more polluted than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, it's a degradation of the environment, and, you know, like, certainly, I mean, like, I worry about stuff other than pollution uh, with kids, but, yeah. like, in general, I think it's just... You know, life is struggle, like it always has been. Um, if we lived in a particularly, like, golden era, it doesn't mean that, like, that's it. No one else move on with humanity, you know, like, mm -hmm. that so seems a little extreme. a tougher question. Yeah. Would you want your kids to surf? I, yeah, I mean, I think about it. Um, and I think about it with my daughter much less about, like, the act of surfing and much more about the culture that goes along with it. Um, like, I love taking her to the beach with me and I want to be able to share that activity with her or my son but at the same time there's times when I wonder whether I want them to like be a part of the culture that goes along with it um, 
particularly my daughter. Like I definitely think about how inherently sexist of a culture surfing still is. Mm -hmm. And uh, like as a professional sport, like the, the female athletes in it are definitely basically expected to be bikini models like first and athlete second. And that's just surfing because like it happens to be an activity you can do in a bathing suit. Um, and so like if she grows up surfing and idolizing professional surfers, her role models are essentially like models, not role models. And that that concerns me, and that I want her to be able to like maybe think a little bit bigger than that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of like just in general, I, I do concern, have some concern that it is a limiting activity in the end, you know, and that like uh, it's hard to do it halfway, you know. It's a really hard thing to like enjoy surfing at this like halfway level. Like most people end up diving completely into it, becoming obsessed, or just kind of letting it go by the wayside and um, it's nice to be able to do other things in life. What are you uh, working on now? What's what's happening? You just um, big new projects or? Steady stream of magazine stuff. Mm -hmm. No giant projects at the moment. Um, busy raising a family and yeah, yeah. doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's taking up more of my time and also I have an actual like, you know, paying job. In writing about surfing you don't make too much money. It's kind of a uh, a lot of people have made money off surfing, but writers are not really one of those people. The people who glass the surfboards don't make any money, yeah. and uh, people who write about surfing don't make any money. People who make the clothes make money. Some of the professional athletes make money. And uh, surfing itself, you're on your goofy foot, right? Mm -hmm. Which people don't know what that means. It basically means your right foot is forward. On a, if you're on a wave, they're, they're called left or right, depending on the facing in. So a left one, that way you're facing the wave. Why is that so superior? I'm, I'm, I'm two. Why is that so superior to the regular foot people? It is a strange thing, being in a, in a minority. Um, in general, there's more regular foots, hence it's called being regular foot, and there are goofy foots. And it's a funny thing you notice that like uh, most regular foots are happy to go either right or left, You know, even though like backside, front side, it's kind of like tennis or something, where one is usually much easier for people than the other. Um, but that said, most regular foots will go on a right or a left, whereas most goofy foots just only want to find lefts. And uh, I'm certainly one of those people. Um, That's what you're finding in Chile, right? Yeah, yeah. all lefts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've literally uh, avoided going right for, you know, what, like 25 years yeah. or something now. There's like an entire half of the surfing uh -huh. world that I just don't want anything to do with. But it's so. actually, you know, there's many on the other side, the regular, so it's kind of statistically, again, we get more lefts than, you know, than they do. So. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's more, you know, when you're part of a, a small club, people always think it's the right club to be in, right? right so, right. yeah, I think that's why Goofy Foots are, consider themselves to be superior. Uh -huh. so. so, we have a little more time here, and I want to open it for people who want to ask questions, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. If there are any. Yeah, if there are any, I are. Please. Um, I have two or three. Okay. <laughs> up. Great. Um, one is, have you heard of Steve Heilig's friend, this great sociologist book, John Irwin's book called Scenes, which is the history of surfing and also the counterculture. He was a big surfer himself mm -hmm. way back, and he died you know, he's in, yeah, right, in his state. 80s. Oh, really? Yeah. But it's a terrific book. By, he's a great criminologist yeah. and sociologist yeah. that Steve knows. So he gravitated about. towards surfing right. naturally, right? I'll have and to check it out. Yeah, criminologist, exactly. <laughs> it's an overlapping of his interests. He was a skier, a uh -huh. athlete, yeah, yeah. weightlifter, a surfer, yeah. criminologist, and he had been in prison as a thug. Yeah. Uh, sure. That's right. how he started. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I would recommend that book. Yeah, I thanks. Have it if you want to borrow it, <laughs> I'd love to movies. check it out. Uh -huh. um, the other one is there's a new movie out by a French film director called Sand Wars about mm -hmm. the planetary issue. I never even heard of it. Mm, it's yeah. a huge yeah. crisis of sand being sand depletion. Yeah. From beaches all over the world. Yeah, this is happening at Ocean Beach. I know what you're talking about. Um, people wonder why, like, the surf has uh, kind of gotten worse over the years at Ocean Beach in San Francisco, and why the beaches you know, uh, falling into the sea at South Slope there, and there's all these different arguments about how they're going to try to protect the uh, sewage treatment facility at South Slope in San Francisco. And uh, no one's really, like, asked the question, well, you guys have been dredging the bay of sand and selling it to cement companies for, like, 35 years. So maybe there's, like, a, uh, you know... Well, it's happening all over the world right. in very uh, serious ways by mafia-type people that kill you and... 
it's very corrupt in India. And they said by the year, I don't know, the next century, there won't be any beaches anywhere. And so yeah. this is a new important film called Sand Wars. Yeah, I have heard about that. It definitely, I think it is important. <laughs> There's a website and trailers. And then the last question I had is just to hear more about women in surfing. Because mm -hmm. I, I live on top of a surfing beach. Mm -hmm. and I didn't ever think of going surfing back in the 70s, even though I wanted to, because there weren't any women out there. Right. And now I see it was a good idea not to, because <laughs> male primates aren't that kind to women when it's just a kind of a jungle situation. Right. And you said kind of a couple of contradictory things. You said on the one hand, now it's kind of egalitarian and things are fine, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it, I don't think that could be true all over the world, surfing world with the big shots or... Uh, con I don't know about Costa Rica, but you yourself said the, the different levels, it's pretty nacho still. Yeah, I mean, it is, depending on where you go, but you know. Molly, you're a female surfer, you can answer this question maybe for me. I mean, I think that it's no reason not to surf. I think that like... Well, I'm probably too old now. No, <laughs> why not? I like boogie boarding. Well, yeah, I think that you can enjoy the ocean and waves on many different levels without being a part of that. Like, at the end of the day, the thing that confuses me sometimes about beginning surfers in general is that they congregate together, you know? That like, there's this idea that you go to the beach and you see other people surfing somewhere and you're like, okay, I'm gonna paddle out right there. And uh, it makes some sense, I guess, in terms of safety and numbers or like learn from others. But my advice to beginners always is like, you know, most of the time you can find a spot where you're away from other people to like just be on your own and learn, and and that's a much better thing to do. So that I like wasn't asking, so I could start serving them. Right. It's more like I'm just yeah. I see so many young women out there, and I was just curious: are they as strong as men? Their shoulders are different. The anatomy is different. You they know, there was a great essay written by a guy named Mickey Munoz, who was a really diminutive, talented surfer in the '60s, about how the best surfer in the world is a guy who like didn't have to exert one drop of effort to go surfing. That he would like step up to the beach and see a riptide and like jump in with his board and just drift out in the riptide. And this could apply equally to a kid or, you know, like anybody. And um, not have to exert any effort to go surfing. That they would just like drift in the current and understand the current and know where the current was going to take them. And then when a wave would come, they would just turn around and be in the perfect spot where they didn't even need to paddle to catch it. And if you really know what you're doing, you can catch waves without even paddling for them. And uh, that his vision of like a perfect surfer wasn't some brute strength, you know, like athlete. It was somebody whose understanding of the ocean was so great that they, you know, needed to exert no energy whatsoever to go surfing. So, uh, I think what you say, I mean, you said before, I mean, there's, a, there's many, many more female surfers than there used to be. They're welcome out there, but this, the culture and the certainly the commercial side is still sexist, basically. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly a sexist sport. I don't doubt that. But I don't think there's anything to preclude women from surfing right. as good as or better than men. Like, so in my perspective. Maybe all over the Western world, America and Europe, uh, men are nicer to women surfers, but maybe, I don't know, I just, are you saying all over the world they are? <laughs> That's hard to Nicer? Watch. Yeah. No. Than before, I don't know. No, <laughs> no I mean. Anyway, you can go change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, here. Hi. Hey. Hi. Good. Nice to see you. Um, I, I was curious, because um, I'm so proud that you're such a wonderful writer. And when I first met your parents, they were wonderful writers, and maybe even before you were around, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wondered the influence, did they have an influence on you in retrospect, or? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that, like, you know, if you grow up uh, and your parents are making art, or, like, doing ceramics, like, likely you're going to learn to make art or do ceramics. And if your parents are writing, like, you're going to feel like that's something that you can do, you know, that that's something people do in the world, that it doesn't feel like it's something that's distant for you. And uh, my mother was a, a great writer. I mean, she definitely, um, I think, led by example in terms of actually, you know, constructing prose and grammar and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure corrected me a million times without me really noticing it. But I, I think that all helped a lot in me being able to, to write without feeling like it was something I needed to, like, learn how to do. It felt pretty natural to me as a kid, you know, um, just as a way of expressing myself. And in terms of my dad, um, you know, He's not as good of a writer, really. My mother was the much better writer. But, um, but he is really great at seeing things in life and saying, like, great, I'm just going to go do that. You know, like, he's pretty fearless in terms of, like, uh, moving forward and executing on stuff and projects. And um, that was hugely 
you know, I mean, I think that's why they wrote books in the end was because he's like, okay, cool, let's let's write books. You know, how hard could it be? And um, I think the same thing held true for, you know, me writing. Others. So, uh, <laughs> what's the future of your surfing, Lewis? How much longer are you going to surf? You? I'm plan to quit after this beer. This is, uh, <laughs> the intervention has worked. It's all over. <laughs> Just one yeah. more, huh? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Steve. Yeah, I had a couple of things. I mean, Kindle love thoughts, but one, this thing about surfing being, you know, in the 60s and 50s, like this outsider activity, fringe, counterculture, outlaw, all of this. And it was beginning to get uh, commercialized in the 60s, too, with Gidget and the movies right. and so on. And now it seems as though the commercialization and the industry is what drives uh, a lot in the profession. You know, the professional surfing contest world is driven by the industry selling mm -hmm. product. And all you were talking about that, and the numbers of surfers, you know, who are now in the water and we see them in the Bolinas. I mean, they're driving up in their. Uh, it's not their old VW bus or right. their Beetle. It's their Lexus and their Audi and their. You know, in the this tech industry in San Francisco that you're part of, and yeah. you, you know these people, they're surfing Ocean Beach. They come up here regularly, yeah. And they know uh, from the internet when there's going to be waves, and the internet's pretty accurate now. So, I mean, it's just this. I was thinking that uh, you know, if you compare it to uh, outsider art or the avant-garde in art, it's not long before. Picasso selling paintings for fifty dollars to Gertrude Stein, and and then he's in the MoMA and you know, right. the, you know, Picasso Museum. It's it's you know it's it's taken over. It's absorbed by uh, the commercial world. It's happened in surfing, and you know you can't see how it could ever change uh, from that. That's one thing. I just toss these out. You can respond if you want. Uh, another thing that came to mind was a great series of articles by William Finnegan. Maybe you've read yeah. them. They were in yeah. the New Yorker and they were about Ocean Beach. Right. Maybe at least 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I think. He used to teach, uh, use those articles in English uh, one class at Mills when I was first starting. So maybe it's 30 years ago. That's yeah, you could definitely make the argument that those are still the best things about surfing. Those are written. terrific. About yeah, surfing. A great photo of somebody, probably Renneker on a big yeah. wave at OB. And, you know, there's just like two big photos, and the prose was beautiful. I mean, he went on to be a New Yorker staff writer, and so on. It's really good, good stuff. But. Yeah, I mean, that was like. Incredibly long too. Yeah, for, they were for two, surfing. Two, two Even for the, it was long for the New Yorker. I mean, it yeah, was like really too long. long. There were two of them. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. beautiful writing, beautiful. and uh, yeah. definitely no. I, I thought about that piece a lot when I was writing yeah. the, nice the one that uh, Steve mentioned called the Wall, which was this idea of like, will surfers ever grow up? I mean, that was kind of part of what he was grappling with in that piece was this idea of like, yeah. when does he move on to pursuing yeah. real life as opposed to surfing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, yeah, he sort of put the, uh, you know, kind of nailed the whole Ocean Beach surf culture right. way back then. Right, which is, again, just like Bellina's changed immensely, as, yeah. as you mentioned. The other so. thing, I'm just wondering what you think about in the current surf world, uh, what's the whole deal with Gabriel Medina and the Brazilians? Brazilian. And, and how does Kelly keep going at age 42? I mean, he's still up there competing with right. people like John John and Gabriel. You know, I mean, it's kind of remarkable. I know you know him. Yeah, and uh, it's not just because you're sending him texts to inspire him, but no, I mean, he is yeah. kind of incredible. Um, Kelly Slater. Kelly Slater, yeah, yeah, that was the guy that I was talking about earlier, who's won all the championships, is like 42 or something, and yeah. still competing at the highest level and in the running for world titles. Which really, not much of that has happened. I don't think in any other sport where somebody who's like not only still playing in their 40s, but actually like still one of the very best. And it is pretty unique to surfing and uh, unique to him. And um, some people make the argument that he's actually like the greatest professional athlete of all time. That there's there's no parallel in any sport. Um, you know, uh, in terms of how he does it, <laughs> I think that uh, he's he's still finding reasons to prove himself. Yeah, you know, I no, mean, I, I think that that really competition. I mean, he's driven by this new generation. Right. That at a certain point, heels. most people get to the, feel uh, pretty secure about their accomplishments and something athletic and or their skills degrade uh one of those two things happens and for him it's just a unique situation where his skills haven't degraded to the point that he needs to step away but he also hasn't lost interest and the reason he hasn't lost interest is because he still feels the need to prove himself that like no matter how many world championships he wins it's not enough for him he like still wants to go out there and show that he's worth you know something in the world 
it feels like he needs to keep competing to do that. Uh, in terms of Brazilians, you know, the first Brazilian world champion this year, I think that it's like just totally indicative of that, you know, longer story of surfing spreading from being a Hawaiian thing picked up by Southern Californians and then spreading to Australia and, you know, Western nations and then eventually like travel took it other places and uh, the economy stifled its growth in Brazil for a long time until it didn't. And, uh, you know, that the kid, Gabriel Medina is just a singular talent, you know, just an incredible, incredible surfer and has had it make it through a lot of uh, adversity in order to get to where he was, including just the typical, like, uh, you know, racism inherent and in what used to be like essentially an all-white male sport, you yeah. know? So hats off to him. He's, it's great that he's done it. Yeah. You know, and on the, the New Yorker piece with the with yeah. Renneker, that the story on that that I heard from somebody at New Yorker was that they had that piece sitting there for a long time and they said, we don't... You know, why are we going to publish something about surfing, really? you know? And it was a long, you know, thing too. And they said, we'll edit it some other time and maybe if we want it. And Doris Lessing, who got a Nobel Prize and was a, an extremely difficult person apparently too, she had a piece ready to go that they were going to run. She pulled it at the last minute, said they couldn't run it. So they had to slot it in there. So it launched this career and everything in the New right. Yorker by just the chance of her saying no. And they had this piece ready and so they put it in. Well, my understanding too is it was one of the last uh, issues, it was the, the issues where it ran was one of the, some of the last stuff prior to uh, Tina Brown, I believe, yeah, right. right? The former editor of Vanity Fair or something went to the New Yorker, and that it was kind of uh, giving the finger to like this fear of what the New Yorker was going to become, right. more commercial magazine. Put surfers in there, that'll ruin it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, let's just uh, <laughs> let's go out with a bang by doing this really self-indulgent, yeah. super long two-part piece on surfing. Yeah, which became a classic. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask a question about um, the implications that your writing has had on, say, the top 44 right. in surfing. So basically, let's say you wrote favorably about two-thirds of the surfers and right. unfavorably about one-third. You still, positive or negative, now have a relationship with those athletes. Right. And <clears throat> positive implications is you're getting emails and Bellinas from Kelly Slater. Negative implications is you could get beat up. but. <laughs> Regardless of taking you out of the situation, you know, how how do you feel like surfing or th those surfers have changed? Like, you've, you've basically influenced the surfing community. Yeah, I mean, inadvertently, I, more than I thought I would. And, like, uh, so what are some of the learnings? Like I said, some of the learnings are just how sensitive, talented people are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I mean, I think it definitely. Uh, I was told this early on by people that, you know, you can't, like, have it both ways. You can't be their friends and also expect to, like, write critically about them. And I've had to move forward with that being the case, that, like, you know, I, I've certainly attempted to, like, stay honest even with the guys who, who I've been friendly with and still take them to task if necessary in, in my writing. Like, if that's what I was going to do ahead of time, try to keep that objectivity. And that can be obviously really tough, that, like, definitely when you know a little bit more of the backstory uh, of these people's lives, it gets much harder to uh, write critically about them and you start thinking more about how it'll impact them as human beings. And um, I think that's definitely one of the lessons of just like writing in the internet age in general, you know, that like you see like people shamed and on Twitter. I mean, there was that article in the New York Times a couple of days ago that was great about public shaming on Twitter. and. Um, the mob mentality that goes along with it, and it's this kind of thing that it is much easier to do when it's uh, virtual, you know, when there's that digital divide between you and a subject, it's much easier to write about them critically, and um, it's a positive and negative thing. I mean, like, you know, hypothetically, some level of objectivity in the press, and, you know, like when, you know, whatever, Watergate came along, they weren't going, God, this is really going to hurt Nixon's feelings, you know, like, <laughs> this might really screw up his life, like, should we really publish this, you know, that obviously surfing is not of political or world import, but like you get to the same level where you have to ask yourself really hard questions about the negative personal impacts some of your work can have on people and um, what do you do with that, you know? And I still ha I had one of those conversations like literally two weeks ago at Ocean Beach where a guy, a kid from Santa Cruz who's, you know, a nice kid and rated in the top, you know, 16 in surfing, um, was really upset about something I had written about him and, you know, we'd previously been fairly friendly and was kind of that point where it was like, well, okay, I guess now we're not going to be friends anymore, you know, like, that's it. I'm not going to softball you just because we know each other. I can't, 
you know, do that and stay even vaguely true to what I'm doing. But there is no real objectivity, you know, and I think that, like, it's pretty tricky. I don't know if that's answering your question at all, but that's the stuff I think about writing about those guys critically sometimes and having some level of personal relationships with them, you know. It definitely is hard to manage both. Is there anyone else writing like you do, Lewis? Is there another balance? Is there someone that... Oh, yeah, I think there's tons of guys who came along... There was precursors, you know, it's not like I invented this wheel. And certainly there's other kids who've come along and have tried to, like, go with a similar tone and mm -hmm. shtick. You know, that it, like, once you see someone doing it, and I think that would be some of my advice to, like, younger kids writing in general is, like, really try to find your own voice and, like, don't just try to copy other people who've come before you. Um, but I think you see some of that, definitely, that, like... Um, Samuel I forget. School of Surf Writing. <laughs> I think that uh, there was a, an article written in an Australian uh, magazine that's a little bit more on the erudite surfing side where they had a whole thing about the new sarcastics. I think that they, they termed it like a, uh, oh. a school of surf journalism right. called the new sarcastics that I was a yeah. charter member of. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there are other people out there. Who, what magazine was that? Currabunga, I think. Oh. It's like a, uh, a quasi-academic journal related to surfing. Oh. PhD guy who wrote it. Karen. Hi. Hi. Were you as taken with that movie Z Boys as I was? It seemed to encapsulate mm -hmm. a lot of what you're talking about. Sure. Three quarters of it was skateboarding, but about one quarter <laughs> was um, surfing. Mm -hmm. And there was such beauty and grace. And there was the fact that some went after the product, others ended up in jail. Right. But I watched that time and time again. Yeah, it's uh, it was a fascinating movie, and one of the main guys in it that they, uh, Jay Adams, um, who was really He's influential. The he went to jail. Yeah. Yes. He went to jail and uh, recently passed away, um, heart attack surfing in Mexico. But uh, the guy Steve's talking about, about Warshaw, who uh, wrote these books, grew up with Jay Adams in Venice, and they were like. Uh, best friends when they were like literally like 12 or something and spent a summer together surfing every day and then just went on these totally opposite life paths you know that like jay went to fame and uh you know prison and all the things that went along with that fame and skateboarding and like kind of that live fast die young hard life like extreme sport type deal and our friend was a little bit more of a reserved personality who uh ended up writing books and surfing and it's just interesting to see the toll I think that it takes on some of those guys and not all of them you know like Stacy Peralta who made the movie um, has done a bunch of great documentaries about surfing and other stuff and you can check out his other films if you like Dark Town and the Z Boys but I think it definitely rang true to that kind of California surf experience of people in that era even if it was more about skateboarding well skateboarding and surfing were definitely yeah, yeah and they were like just two organizations most people did both you know depending on, you know yeah right well, so I want to thank you very much for coming here. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you were able to do thank it. Thank you guys for putting up with me.